Dang. Okay, sweet. We're live. I'm going to tweet that because how do you do anything in life without tweeting it? Um, and yeah, cool. Let's go ahead and get started. So um, yeah, my name is Kent C. Dodds, and I, um, I guess I'm supposed to give you a little spiel about um, PayPal and stuff. And so that's what this is. Um, oh, I'm not sharing my screen. Let me do that really quick. Okay, now you're not going to see my face. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is the PayPal job site. You can get there with paypal.com slash careers. And um, in here, you can do a job search by uh, keyword, or you can look for, I actually don't know, software development, um, and do a search there. And I'll tell you what, if you identify a job that you are interested in that's listed here, like we've got it all over the place, um, San Jose home office of PayPal. But if you find a job that you're interested in, then uh, send me a link to like three or four uh, jobs that you're interested in and I will, uh, and, and send me your resume and I'll get you uh, referred to that position. So um, PayPal is an awesome place to work. I, I've been at PayPal the longest of all my jobs. Um, that is just over two years now. Um, so I don't know what that says about me, but <laughs> um, I love it uh, at PayPal. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but also this was about like, if I'm looking for work and I'm, I'm not looking to change jobs, but, um, I am an instructor on front end masters and they're actually doing a, a sale right now for the next two hours. Um, so yeah, pull up your, um, oh, you can't see my mouse. Oh, bummer. Sorry. Um, I'm not sure what to do about that. So you're just, yeah, that kind of is a real bummer. Oh, well, um, anyway. Uh, so yeah, pull up your phone and, and get this because it's there's the the sale doesn't go on very often on front end masters and there's just a huge amount of uh, of knowledge on here. For me personally, I have stuff on ES Lanes and Babel, working ASTs, testing JavaScript, um, open source and Webpack. Webpack deep dive honestly out of date, but there's an upcoming update to that. So. Um, and it's given by the Sean Larkin, so check that out. Um, looks like the live stream is, oh, I can only see my on the screen, what? I don't even know. Um, okay, so anyway, I am also doing uh, workshops next week, so if you sign up with Front End Masters, you can actually like watch these, so advanced react patterns. So what we're gonna talk about today is just like a little um, kind of preview to that. Uh, I'm also giving a revamp of my testing uh, workshop and my testing React applications uh, workshop. Oh, shoot. I know what's going on. There we go. Now the live stream can see um, the right stuff. <laughs> Sorry, live streamers. Okay. So that is um, that. And then for, um, oh, yeah. Also, I'm on Egghead.io. So subscribe there too. If, kind of depends on what you're into, but Egghead is great. Um, lots of good stuff. I used to do Angular stuff, um, but now I'm more into the React and um, regular JavaScript stuff. Uh, and then the last thing, um, I'm on Workshop Me. So Workshop Me is this cool thing. I'm giving a workshop live in Portland, um, and then another one in Salt Lake City, and then um, another in Salt Lake um, around the same time of React Rally. So. Um, yeah, and then I'm also available for private training. So fill out this form if you want me to come and, and train you and your company privately. And uh, it's a lot of fun. OK, cool. So that's all that I wanted to share about that. Um, and now we can get into the meat of what we're talking about. So uh, this is five React patterns to make your React components more useful. Uh, this is a bunch of information about me. Um, I'm not going to go over it all. I have a link to my slides down here. It's kcd.im slash five useful React patterns with hyphens. Um, you can go check these things out. Um, that's, that's a link to a picture of my cute puppy. Um, so yeah, go enjoy that. Um, if we were all together, then I would ask you to please stand and we do air squats together. But I've, I always feel awkward. Doing that remotely, so I'm not going to do that today. But you can feel free to do air squats if you want to. I'm just going to move on. <laughs> so I'd like to start my talks out with expectations. Um, so this talk is examples of uh, complex component implementations and APIs. 
um, and then pattern two can use to simplify those. It, it, it like in, in an effort to um, not go too far into the weeds and, and help you understand what I'm talking about, the actual component is pretty simple itself. Um, and so uh, hopefully you can transition that from the uh, component to like more complex uh, components, at least um, like the patterns that we'll be applying. Um, and oh, there was something else I was going to mention, but I can't remember. Um, so this talk is not geared to React and JavaScript beginners. Um, I'm going to be using modern JavaScript. So if you're not familiar with the uh, latest features of JavaScript, um, there might be some syntax that you're not familiar with. Um, if you're pretty new to React, then um, this is really geared um, for you. Or you can lean over to your neighbor and ask um, what on earth is this we're talking about. Um, but if that is you, you can check out um, the beginner's guide to React. Um, and this is a totally free course on Egghead.io that I have for you. It's kcd.im slash beginner React. And then um, if you want to dive deeper into the um, patterns that I'm showing you, I have a course on Egghead also about advanced React patterns um, that you can uh, jump into. I'm going to give that an update pretty soon with the uh, latest APIs in React 16. So. Cool. OK, let's go ahead and get started into our stuff. That's actually all my slides. The rest of this stuff is going to be in Code Sandbox, one of my favorite tools for developing software. Um, so oh, and the, the thing that I was going to, I wanted to say earlier, and I forgot. Um, if you have questions as we go, I'm going to pause every now and then and ask for questions. And so actually, let me move um, this over here to my other monitor so I can have this open and ready for, um, yeah, to turn to you if you have any questions. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll pause every now and then and, and stop for questions. Um, but uh, yeah, let's jump into things. So the first pattern we're going to talk about is render prompts. Um, so here we have a pretty simple toggle component. Um, it has this ability to have this little switch thing that's kind of cool, and it'll um, tell us whether the button is on or off. And in our use case, for the first time we ever created this component, we um, had this usage function, and, uh, or sorry, we, we had this usage of the toggle component, where there's on content and off content, and uh, that gets rendered right above the switch. So that's pretty cool. Um, then later on down the road, somebody comes and says, hey, listen, I really like your, um, your toggle component. I need that same thing in my section of the app or in a totally different app entirely. Um, so could you share that with me? And you say, great, yeah, I, I package this up, and now you can use it. And then they say, oh, wait, I actually need the text to be under, not over. So I need this to be rendered below. And you're like, well, I mean, I, I could do this, and that would, that would fix it. But then it breaks my other implementation, which expects it to be above. So I guess what I'll do is um, I'll add this content position. Uh, prop that you can you can have. So we'll just say, OK, uh, pull that off of props, content, position. And um, then we'll say, if, uh, uh, let's see, content position is top, then we'll render this stuff. Otherwise, we'll render null. And then we'll do uh, the opposite if it's bottom. Um, cool. And that's like forked. Like because we don't default it. So let's go ahead and default it. We'll say top. We could use default props, but I'm not going to waste uh, waste your time. So um, yeah, cool. So our old implementation is still working. Let's just make sure we can uh, get this new implementation working. Um, whoops. Hey, cool. So they both work, and now we're happy, and, and people can go on their way. And then somebody else comes to you and says, hey, listen, um, I know that I have the, all the content on the top and some of it on the bottom. Uh, or 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 on the bottom, but I actually need the on content to be on the top and the off content to be on the bottom. So how can I do that? And so you say, okay, well instead we'll do this um, on content position and off content position. And now I'm I'm not even going to type that because it'd be a nightmare. So I'm going to copy it from down here, and we'll come up here. We'll say, we would just pull that there. Switch through this to this dot. And then pull these off. Um, here it's off content position, on content position. 
and we'll default that to the top. Okay, cool. So now our original implementation still works. Um, oh, actually, no, we broke this. So breaking change, um, let's say on content position and off content position equals bottom two. Okay, great. Good. And then we can um, get rid of this thing and switch to this use case. And now we have the thing switching back and forth. Now, like this, like I said, this is a little contrived, but who would actually create a UI like this? This is annoying. But hopefully, um, this um, ha like kind of strikes a chord with some of you. I know that this is something that I've done in building React. Is I start doing some really, really weird things in my render method so that I can account for a bunch of different use cases um, for this reusable component that I'm trying to build. And so this is one of the biggest problems that the render props pattern solves. And so rather than doing all of this nastiness, I'm going to switch us over to a render prop solution. Oh, and what if we wanted to have a custom button? Then we'd have to do a totally different thing there, too. So that'd be super annoying. OK, so here's the actual solution with render props. You return. Um, this dot props dot children and you invoke that function. Um, I think I, I kind of jumped into this a little quick, so I'm I'm gonna um, take a step back here really uh, really quick and um, iterate our um, our way to um, where render props is actually useful. So I'm gonna let's see, we'll pull out this usage example and be right here. Um, OK, so we're going to pull um, we're going to pull this stuff out, simplify it considerably, get rid of all this stuff. We're just going to kind of start from scratch here. Okay. Cool. So now we have um, this situation where we want to be able to render things however we want. I want to be able to uh, render the uh, text at the bottom, or I want to render one at the bottom. I want to do whatever I want. I want to have total control. And so to, to begin this process of uh, giving this control, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this render method. I'm going to clip it out, and I'm going to create a new one on the instance. I'll call it this dot render switch. Then I'll make that render switch. And whoops, add the parentheses there. OK, cool. So now we're, we're rendering the switch. Cool. Um, now I, I'm going to make this a pure function. So let's go ahead and pull in on and toggle. And rather than getting on from state, we're going to get it from the uh, parameters here. And rather than getting uh, toggle from this, we'll get it uh, from our parameters here as well. Then we'll just pass those things. So I'll say on this dot state dot on and toggle is this dot. So it still works. Awesome. So well, the function is that it means that it, it doesn't need to be a property or a method on the toggle class. So let's see what happens when I do that. Let's pull this off. Oops. We'll make this a function, still a pure function. And then rather um, rather than this dot, we'll just call render switch directly. Cool, and it still works. OK, so um, I actually haven't changed the, the base use case of this toggle component. Um, it still works exactly the same. The API to it is exactly the same. And this is the part where we changed the API. Sorry, you couldn't see me, but I was taking a drink. <laughs> um, so what if instead of using using our reference to the render switch function, what if we accepted it from props? We say this dot props dot render switch, and then on here I'm I'm gonna actually rip all this out. Boop, do. So this is our basic usage. Now I need to pass this as a prop. So we'll say render switch equals render switch. Okay, so it's all still working. Okay. Cool. So now I could actually, like if I want to, I don't have to, but if I want to, I could just copy and paste it right there. Huh. Oh, this works still. 
And uh, yeah, then like more often what you're going to see with these render props is they're going to be arrow functions. Um, and part of the reason is because it's a little bit more terse, so we can get rid of that um, that return and those curly braces. And here we go, still working. Uh, and then uh, I, I actually kind of like, I like to think of my component uh, or my React structure as a tree um, and like with a, a component that has children. And so I'm going to do this toggle. I'm going to move this prop. I'm going to rename. Actually, here, before we do that, let's let's just rename this to children first. Okay, cool. That's also working. And now um, I'm going to give us that nice tree structure by um, using the implicit children prop. Okay, hey, cool. Great. So that, that's the render props pattern right there. Um, it is like, I, I feel like going through it that way, it's actually pretty straightforward. You have your render function. You're going to extract that into a property. You'll make that property a function. Then you'll extract that, that function out. And then you'll pass that as a prop instead. And what that gives you is if we uh, comment this back out and then come down here to uh, the solution here. <clears throat> is the ability to render whatever you want, wherever you want, as the user of uh, the component. And I have two props that I need to expose for that, as opposed to um, all the props we had here. Not only that, I can also provide any button that I want. So I'm in control of this switch. I could, I could do a button. Um, and on click, toggle, and he will say on. Okay. Um, oh, and say if it's on, then um, on. Otherwise, off. Okay, cool. I, I can render whatever I want to in this thing. I can render some buttons. I can render messages. I can do anything. And what's what makes me really excited about this pattern is what it means for um, our old API. So the, the original API was actually pretty simple. You just use the toggle thing, you pass the on toggle, and it took care of what it rendered for you. Um, and that was kind of nice. But now we have like a whole bunch of complexity stuff in our usage. So we're just like moving from one um, layer of abstraction to another and, and making it more complicated to use this toggle component. But here's the cool thing about the vendor product. API is that you can actually implement the old API on top of the new one. So um, here is an old toggle component that's built on top of this new toggle component, and uh, has an old usage that uses the old old um, API, but it's built on top of the um, new um, implementation. So here, if we swap out usage for old usage. Um, then we're going to get that same experience that we had before. And so users of this old toggle, if that's what, if that's the API that they want, then they can use this, and it's it's really straightforward and simple. But those who have a little bit more um, complex use cases can use the render prop API directly. And that's render props. I'm going to stop right there for questions. Anybody have questions? <laughs> I can't, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. Somebody will have to, yeah, walk up and say hi. No, no, the webcam is just like, yeah, the webcam is amazing now. On this side. Okay. Nope. Hey there, Ken. Hi. Hey. I can see you. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I've been using uh, the render props that I've been doing with a property that goes on the render props that I've been doing with a prop called render that goes on the first component, but I see you're using it like kind of as children. Can you explain the difference between the two or when I would use one or the other? Yeah, sure. Good question. So uh, just to reiterate, the question is, um, here we're calling it children, but in some other components, you might call it render. Um, and uh, and then instead of using children here, you'd actually, here, we'll just refactor this really quick. Render equals that. And those are functionally equivalent, um, except now I'm all messed up. Hold on a second. Here we go. Um, so yeah, those are functionally equivalent to APIs. They're just slightly different. Uh, so that's literally the only difference is what you call it. Um, 
they're uh, in, inside of React, they, they treat the children prop a little bit special, but that, that in practice, that doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, another thing about the children prop API is if you um, don't format things with prettier, which why would you not format things with prettier? But if, if you don't format them quite right, um, then you can wind up with the children um, prop as an array. Um, and so like, it, in fact, it's pretty easy to do that. We just add a div right there. And then it busts everything because children is uh, an array and function. And so there is a little bit of that there, like inside of your render prop function, you could uh, say, if it's an array, just grab me the first one, uh, maybe throw an error or something like that. So there's a bit of that. You, actually, you could probably just add prop types to say children has to be a function. I think that's what downshift does. Um, and so you can kind of avoid that problem. The reason that I choose children over render is because I, I like the shape of this. I like being able to see where the toggle is, is finished. Um, it, also, it means that uh, with, you know, let's see if I can get back to where we were before. Well, anyway, with the render prop API, um, you could have your render here. Pull that there. And then like this render could actually be super long. Uh, that's not really uncommon. And then you can have like really important thing um, here. And so you look at this thing and you think, oh, that's all the props. It's just on toggle and render. When in actuality, there's something really important that's at the bottom. Um, and you can't run into that problem with uh, with children. So I, that's why I prefer children. Uh, any other questions? OK, sweet. So I'm going to move on to our next one, which is the provider pattern. Um, and so this is actually using the render prop that we just built. Um, but it's going to reveal a um, kind of an annoyance um, that I've had. And this actually is not related at all necessarily to the render prop pattern. Um, this is an annoyance that I've, I've had in like just in, in applications in general. Uh, how many people? Oh, I forgot to switch this back. Whoops. How many people are familiar with the um, prop drilling problem? Raise your hand. Okay, just a couple. That's all right. Um, so the prop drilling problem, I'll demonstrate for you. Um, so here we have our usage, and like it's it's pretty basic. Um, it's using our our render prop here. Um, but we're passing the render props um, or, or the, um, the props that are being passed into our function onto another component. And then that component actually doesn't care about those props. It just moves uh, forward those on to another uh, component. And then that one does. It's going to be in charge of rendering our text. But then it forwards the rest of them onto layer three. Layer three doesn't care about those props, so it forwards those on. And then layer four um, is going to forward those on to another component that actually cares about those props. Um, and so this is what's called prop drilling. It's like super, super annoying. So like what happens if I decided I wanted to rename this to uh, toggle on? Well, then I have to go all the way down and, and um, update all the names of all the props. And it's super annoying. Um, what if I uh, like, and, and like you might say, oh, well, you just do props and then um, spread these. That would work just as well. The problem is uh, if, if for anybody who's built a sizable application with a large enough team, you come and see spread props all over the place, you wind up spread, um, passing props in places they have no, um, no um, use or um, function for being there. And it makes it really hard to delete code because you don't know is it okay for me to delete this prop? I don't know. So I'll just keep on, on passing it along. So it makes it kind of hard to maintain. So this is the, the prop drilling problem. The, the other uh, problem is, okay, so where do you put the prop types? Am I going to um, define some prop types for on and toggle on layer one and layer two and layer, and layer four and the switch component? Do I have to have prop types on all of those? Uh, I, like, I have an answer to that question, but I like, it's, I, I would really like to have to ask that question. Um, so yeah, the prompt calling um, thing is like super annoying. And that's what the provider pattern kind of helps us to avoid. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to just build this out. I'm just going to show you. Um, so let's get rid of our 
um, toggle and our usage up here. And uh, use React.create context, a sweet, amazing new API in React 16. Um, this is going to get, get a default um, context object. And this is the object that's going to be uh, made available to us anywhere in the tree that we're rendering. Uh, this toggle context gives us back two components. It's an object with two components. One is called a consumer. The other is a provider. Um, the provider provides a value. And then the consumer um, is able to get that value out of context anywhere it's rendered in the tree. So we'll see what that looks like here in a second. Um, so when we, um, Whenever the, the state of this component is changed, so on its toggle, then um, it's going to get re-rendered, value will be changed, and all the consumers will be re-rendered as well. So let's look at how that uh, changes our usage example. So here we have our usage, uh, and we don't need to pass anything to this layer component, because this layer component doesn't actually need anything, uh, anything at all, in fact. And so it just renders layer two. And then layer two does need something from the toggle. And so it's going to say hey, toggle consumer, which is just pointing to our toggle context consumer. And it's uh, actually React Context. The React Context API uses a render prop as a child. And so um, here it's gonna we're going to take a function, and it's going to pluck off the on property from our value that's being provided in context. And then it's just going to render this fragment with on, um, this button is on, and then it'll render layer three. Uh, because layer three doesn't have any props that it needs, it uh, re-renders uh, layer four, and that's, that's fine. We don't have to worry about forwarding any props that layer three doesn't care about. And uh, then layer three renders layer four, and layer four does care about um, those props, so it's going to use the consumer again. And it's going to pull out the on and toggle property from the value that the provider is giving, and it'll render the switch with those props. And that's the provider pattern. This is actually like uh, before uh, React uh, create context, that this was still like widely around. Uh, you're probably using it if you're using React Router or uh, React Redux. Um, these, uh, the provider uh, component that those expose um, are uh, basically implementing this pattern. And React is infinitely easy to implement this pattern uh, with create context. And that's and that's it. That's the provider pattern. What questions do you all have for the provider pattern? Uh, I have one. <laughs> hey, Ken. Um, so here, the consumer. Access like layer uh, accessing that toggle the consumer optically. Sorry, you were like really badly cutting out. Could you say that again? Oh, sorry. So in layer four, for example, uh, that function on eighty one, it's getting access to toggle the consumer lexically. Mm -hmm. So if you were to define layer four in a different file, would you be importing the toggle.consumer component into all of those files where you wanted to to use it? <laughs> yeah, so I'd say import toggle from, whoops, um, toggle, whatever, whatever you're going to call that file. Um, and okay. then I just use toggle.consumer. Great. All right, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Thank heavens thanks. for ES modules. Boy, do, does anybody remember working in JavaScript before modules? Yikes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, good times. Was there another question? Yeah, actually, I had a question. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. changed with the new context API for this pattern? Good that question. So here, let me show you something. Um, I have a blog post for you. Um, actually, it's not a blog post yet, but it will be. Um, so if you actually if you go to kcd.im slash news, I have a newsletter that you all can subscribe to. It's weekly stuff about um, JavaScript, React testing, bunch of bunch of interesting things. Um, and uh, two weeks after I publish the newsletter to my subscribers, I'll put it up on my blog, blog.kencdods.com. And um, so yeah, you can find this uh, what I'm about to show you there pretty soon. Um, but yeah, if we just look at the letter archive. 
this um, last Monday's newsletter was about migrating uh, to React's new context API. And so this will show you kind of before and after. Um, it wasn't very fun. You had this, um, this string to identify context, and that's how you would consume context as well. You'd have to have this context types and any consumer. These are static properties. Um, and then the, the producer of context had to have this child context types and get child context. Um, and it, it was a very, like lots of indirection. And um, I, I never felt really great about the API. And that's probably why. Oh, sorry. I keep forgetting to switch the screen. Um, yeah, that's probably why the um, um, API was never actually official was because they didn't they weren't very happy with it. So go ahead and give this a, a look over um kcd.im slash um yeah slash yeah. news and uh yeah that'll hit my blog in a week and a half. Any other questions? Okay, sweet. So um yeah let's go ahead and talk about our next pattern higher order components. How many people are using higher order components right now? All right, All right. cool. Um, I, I expect that most of you probably aren't. Um, but if you are, then um, enjoy seeing an implementation. <laughs> so here we have our uh, provider pattern um, component. And this one actually, I, I changed this slightly uh, to support not only uh, the provider pattern directly, but also the render prop pattern. Um, so the toggle component is actually um, the original implementation and the, the provider pattern are both supported from this toggle component. We just take the children, and if it's a function, then we're going to call it um, with our, our state. Otherwise, um, we'll just use the children and render that. So kind of fun. You can do do both. Um, that's one of, my, one of the fun and exciting Parts of this whole like pattern stuff is like mix and mingle these different patterns to make really flexible and um, straightforward API for components and um, make them really reusable. Uh, okay, so yeah, all that stuff's pretty much the same. Um, so when we look at this though, like this is a fair amount of extra work that we have to do anytime we want to consume this um, this stuff. It's like if you had to do this all over your application using these render props, it might get kind of annoying. Um, and then there are other uh, use cases for higher order components as well. Um, it's just it's one method to, to share code um, in a way that's um, sometimes a little bit more straightforward. Um, it's it's less. I, I should preface all this by saying it is infinitely less flexible than render props, um, but it can solve many of the same problems. Uh, with a little less code. And so um, yeah, so yeah. let's go ahead and take a look at what we want um, to be able to do. And then we'll um, take a look at how that's implemented. Uh, so we want to have a function that um, can give us a component um, that will call um, our um, another component that we provide to it. So if we were to say this is a component, it accepts a toggle prop that has an on property. And then we can render that. Um, and that's that's kind of the API that we're looking for. So that is a higher order component, and let's go ahead and take a look at that. Um, we actually don't need to change our implementation of the uh, toggle component; works just fine um, as it is. We just create this function called with toggle. Uh, so if you're using uh, React Router, you have with Router. If you're using React Redux, you have with Redux. Um, yeah, or not? Sorry, not with Redux. It's called Connect. Um, but uh, if you're using glamorous or styled components, those actually are higher order components themselves. So styled.div is a higher order component. Uh, it's just kind of uh, fancy with the tag te template literal. Um, so yeah, this with toggle accepts a component, and it renders that component. Um, but it does that inside a, a, of the toggle consumer. So we've already seen this. Uh, this is how we actually implemented um, Things before uh, any of our other consumers implemented the toggle or, or used the toggle consumer, so now we're just doing that for you, and then passing um, what we're that that value that we're getting to the toggle prop, and then you can consume that yourself. So um, our with toggle is our function component, and it ex 
accepting a toggle prop and it's pulling the on property off of that toggle object. And then uh, it's just doing an implicit return here, rendering this fragment uh, just like it was before. So a couple interesting things about what we're doing with this um, with toggle. So we're creating this new component, but we're doing it in an interesting way. This is a sweet, amazing new feature in React 16.3 um, called react.forwardref. So one super annoying thing about um, higher order components um, from my perspective is um, it's really difficult to make the fact that a component is actually a higher order component um, uh, unobservable. So if we look, if we wanted to, we could extract this to um, const layer two component, and then we pass this uh, to our with toggle. So um, what we really like, all that we really care about is that uh, this layer two component. That's what we're we're trying to render, and this with toggle is just helping um, us get some props to that thing. Um, but when we render this layer two, it's actually going to be rendering this wrapper component. And um, and then that will render this layer two component. Um, and so if you look at the dev tools, you'll have the wrapper and then you'll have the layer two component as a child of that. Um, so what the one problem with this was if I wanted to render layer two and I wanted to get um, a reference to uh, this layer two component, if I wanted to get the ref, then I'd have to, um, like I'd, I'd say, okay, layer two, here, let's just do it here, layer two ref equals uh, this dot uh, layer to ref, whatever you want to call that. Um, but this is going to give me a reference to the wrapper and not the underlying component, which is what I probably want. And so that's the problem that the forward ref API solves made um, making higher order components much better. What you had to do before was you'd have like an inner ref prop and, and then forward that onto the ref prop. Uh, but React solved that for us. So that's kind of nice. Um, and uh, so that's one thing that you have to do when making a higher order component is just take care of forwarding the ref. Um, another thing, if you ever use React Dev Tools, you're going to see the display name. If you see like errors in the console, you're going to see the display name of all the components. And so here we're going to um, add a display name to our wrapper component so that it has a useful, um, at least semi-useful name. So this is going to be um, a with toggle and then whatever the component we, we pass to it. Um, and then this hoist react statics is like super, super annoying. Um, like if we were to have a class um, called my component and that then react component, then it has a static property called, I don't know, sub component. And it renders a div or something like that. It could be any static property um, on this my component, um, and then and maybe we get that in the render method or something. So if we were to wrap this and we get um, let's see class wrap my component equals um, with toggle my component. Um, so what we're getting back with the wrapped my component is um, this wrapper. And so the wrapper is actually not going to have the subcomponent. And so if we try to um, use properties um, of the my component um, with wrapped my component, then we wouldn't actually be able to access subcomponents. So if I tried uh, subcomponent, I won't actually have access to that. Um, and so that's why we have to have this hoist non react statics thing um, so that we. We can basically try to make the um, that's perfect const. Uh, try to make the fact that we're using a higher order component um, unobservable. So you can basically treat the wrapped version of this component as the component that it's wrapping. Um, so that's kind of annoying, but that's an important part of this uh, this pattern as well. Um, and then we just return the the wrapper, and that is um, higher order components. In general, like this, this is the one of the simplest forms of a higher order component. That you don't have to accept a component; you could accept options and then like return an entirely different component altogether. Um, you can do real. You could return a, a function that generates a component. You can do all. That's what Connect does. Um, you can do all kinds of things. Um, and so, yeah. But that's the the basic idea. I would say that with um, 
with the fact that higher order components are less flexible than um, render props, what I always recommend is that um, if you're going to make a higher order component for something, that you implement a render prop for that first, and then use that render prop to um, help you build your higher order component. Um, that way, people who need additional flexibility can use the render prop. Um, and then those who want uh, maybe a potentially simpler or smaller API um, can use the higher order component. And that's one of the nice things about the render prop API, again, is, is that it's just so flexible um, that it allows you to compose things on top of uh, the render prop API. So that, that's our higher order component. What questions do you have? No questions. Higher order components are are dumb. So who cares? No, just kidding. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to solve a different problem. Uh, so before, like all three of the last examples were helping us. Uh, well, in general, they were helping us solve problems with our UI, how it's rendered, who who's in charge and responsible for rendering UI. Uh, especially the render prop pattern is responsible for that. You could use the provider pattern and the um, um, the higher order components to um, to do other things, but in general, that's that's what we were doing in these examples. Um, the state reducer pattern is um, super useful for um, logic, and so here we are using our provider pattern uh, version of this thing, uh, just like we had before. And we have this situation where I want to be able to count how many times this has been clicked. And then once you hit um, more than four, I want to stop. I don't want you to be able to click anymore until you click the reset button. And then you can click some more until, um, um, until you get to that stop point. And because we're like running out of time, I'm just going to uh, show this right to you really quick. And we'll, we'll keep this one brief, um, which will kind of take some of the Oh, wow, that's really cool away from this, but it is what it is. So um, what if I could hook into the um, set state of this component right here? What if like any time set state was called inside that component, I could hook in and say, nope, nope, I'm not going to let you do that um, and, and change the state that is about to be set. That's what the reducer, um, the state reducer pattern allows us to do. And so this, uh, um, if we look at the use, like the usage example, we have this toggle state reducer. It accepts our state and our changes. And we um, are storing our own state for how many times this thing has been clicked. And so we say, hey, if in my state, if I have kept track of how many times these things have been clicked, it's been clicked more than, more than or equal to four times, then I'm going to go ahead and let you change whatever you want, except I'm going to um, uh, keep on as false, and it can't change to anything but false. It has to stay false, um, and then like um, the implementation of toggle will um, make sure that that actually takes. Um, otherwise, we'll just return the changes. So we'll let you do whatever you want to do. Um, but if I if you click more than four times, then I'm going to force you to always um, set the state to on uh, is false. So the implementation of this. Um, there are a couple important things. One of them I forgot. So anytime um, you use this dot set state, you're actually going to call internal set state, and internal set state is going to do the set state for you. So you'll you'll pass your changes. It it, it has the same API um, as set state. So the changes and the callback changes can be a function, uh, and so then we'll. Uh, call this dot set state with an updater that's going to get our um, state. And then we'll take our changes. Um, I, I put it in this little, in these brackets because I don't want to, because uh, I want to use map over it. Map, 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 and then pull it out. Um, so, yeah, the first time we're going to um, say, okay, well, in some cases, we're going to be calling um, internal set state with a function. So, we'll, if it is a function, we'll call it with the current state. And then we'll return that. Um, so the changes is now just an object. And then we can apply the state reducer. Um, so we'll call uh, this dot state reducer with the current state that we're getting from our updater function and the changes um, that we're trying to make. 
And then um, that's going to give us our new state to set, and we'll return that. And then we'll call whatever callback was, was provided. That's, that's just set to set job. Um, and so from, from that, we can like, change anything that's happening inside of the component. If it wants to try and change on false or to true, then we can change that. We could um, and base that off of any other state that we want. Uh, this is a pretty simplified version of this. Um, for the state producer to actually be useful, it, like, just like in Redux, like imagine if in Redux you had all these actions, but none of them had a type. So you had like, this is the, the state that I want to set, um, but you didn't have a type, so you couldn't, like no reducers could be matched, like all, like, and, and you know, chaos ensues. So um, in, a, in an actual implementation, um, you'll want your state reducer, or, or anytime you call internal set state to have a type and then pass that type to the state reducer. Um, but this is like the a basic implementation of a state reducer. And it gives you uh, a lot of power over the internal state of this component um, with a pretty minimal API on top of it. Uh, it feels pretty straightforward. Okay, we just have one more, but I'm gonna just quickly stop and ask for any questions that anybody has. If somebody could just smile really quick. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, um, great. So this is the last one, control props. And for this one, I can I have two toggles, and they can toggle independently, or I can make them stay in sync, um, or I can have it broken. What? Dang it! Uh, what happened? Oh, oh, wait, no. Sorry, sorry. This is what we want it to do, um, but it doesn't do it right now. Ha! So um, I, I want to be able to make these two things stay in sync, and so. Um, yeah, right now we have, um, yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot of interesting about, about this. Let's just take a look at the solution, how this, uh, how we can make this happen. So from a usage standpoint, uh, we're going to have this, um, both on, um, and also this sync state and that toggle sync is happening anytime you, you check this. And so it's checked on, we can turn it off and they can be independent, and then we can uh, turn those off again um, and have them be in sync. And so what we're doing in here is we say, hey, if my state is in sync, then I'm gonna say uh, toggle props on equals this dot state dot both on, and then I'll spread those uh, toggle props across both of them. And so when I'm in sync, the toggle props is gonna have our on toggle um, handler and an on prop. And so, uh, actually, if you've ever used the um, like a controlled input, like actually this is a controlled input. Um, this is exactly like what that is. This is control props. Um, and so when when you uh, assign a um, like a, the value to a regular input, or here the checked for uh, this input, then it will say, okay, I will not control my own state. I will give you suggestions on, on what you should change. So in a regular input, uh, which is probably what, oops, value I, oops. Um, I can type in here all day long and it's not gonna do anything because it's um, just going to give me suggestions on what to update, but it's not going to um, um, ever make the updates itself. So it's not managing its state by itself. So you have to pass this on change prop um, to handle those changes and then update state and then update the value um, if you want this to be in read only. You'll actually get a warning in the console if you don't provide an on change prop for uh, an input. So that's exactly what we're doing here with our control prop. So the way that you can do this is um, we added this method called is on controlled, and we say this dot props dot on is not equal to undefined. Um, and so if if the prop is provided, um, then we're going to assume it's controlled. Uh, and if it's not provided, then it's not controlled. So that means we can control it ourselves. Um, and then because of uh, this, where we have state that can come from one of two places, we're going to add this is on method that will get the state wherever it's coming from. So we don't have to add that logic um, everywhere we're, we're using the on state. 
So here we're just saying, if it's controlled, then get the state from props. Otherwise, we'll get the state from our internal state. And then um, that's what we use in our switch. Uh, we render is on. And so when, um, when we're in sync here, we're providing the on prop. And so that's how the switch is getting. Um, it's, uh, well, it's on site, it's through props. And then in toggle, we're going to say, hey, if it's controlled, then let's. we're not going to update our own state because we could like re-render ourselves unnecessarily. We don't even control our own state anyway, so like it's not. A, we don't need to, to re-render uh, necessarily. And so we'll just call uh, this dot props dot on toggle with um, with this the suggestion. So we're suggesting, hey, it was true, but now it, we're suggesting to you that it should be false. But you do whatever you want to with that. I, I don't care. Um, I just want. Uh, I, I'm just suggesting to you that because they toggled it, it should be false. Um, if it's not controlled, then we'll do the same thing we were doing before. Um, we'll set our state ourselves. It'll render ourselves. Um, we'll also call uh, this dot props on toggle with the new state of um, is on because this is happening in a callback that um, this dot is on is going to be the the new value of uh, the state. And that is uh, control props. So with that, that's all that I had for you. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions. I think I probably went a little bit over time. Um, so sorry about that if I did. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your uh, the props themselves. The, the patterns and thanks for telling us about you giving us a lot of resources to where we can go learn more take your courses i know you have um a lot to show off part of the reason i invited ken here or to do this is because i saw him at react rally in 2016. he's an awesome presenter so um thanks for everything that you do for the community including like your open source and the free courses that you have available well thank you that was nice <laughs> Can't see that. Thank <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Did, it, did anybody have any questions or anything at, um, just at the end here? Oh, no, it froze. What's the what? Did anybody have any questions just at the end here? He might not be able to hear that question. Kent, what's the C for? Oh, Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> kind of boring. Sorry. Ben Lash likes to say chimichanga, so you can say that too if you want. Okay, chimichanga god. <laughs> Any other questions? Can you kind of plug your downshift library? Um, so I'm starting a search plugin, and I was looking at using it, and I just kind of like to know more about it. Yeah, sure. So downshift, um, it uh, actually downshift is the source for like all of my learnings of these advanced patterns. Um, so downshift is a, um, a auto or it's an enhanced input uh, primitive component. So it allows you to build enhanced inputs. Enhanced inputs being things like um, drop downs, autocomplete, type ahead, um, any, anything like that with that experience where um, you can um, open some sort of menu as the user is interacting with your component. Uh, they can select an item um, out of, they can select multiple items Stuff like that. So lots of you may be familiar with uh, React Select, which has been uh, for a couple of years now. It's been the de facto standard for to solve this problem. Um, but I built Downshift because um, with lots of the other, uh, or, or with all of the other implementations of these kinds of components, uh, it didn't give me the control over my render method that I wanted. And so uh, Downshift, because it uses a render prompt, I have complete and entire like total control. I don't need to, like, if I want to style things differently, I don't have to use a, like, a list of class names that I'm, I'm adding styles to. I can just use my CSS and JS library because I'm in charge of rendering that input. I can style it however I want. Um, I can choose whether the menu opens above or below just based on how I'm rendering stuff inside of that render method. I don't have to learn some special API for, um, you know, what's the prop to control that. Um, and also, that's where I, um, so I say I discovered the state reducer pattern. I didn't invent the re uh, state reducer pattern, but I, I um, 
um, discovered it uh, with downshift. And so that state reducer pattern is actually super powerful with a component like downshift where it makes some opinions about like when the user starts typing, the menu opens. Well, that works in one case, but maybe if you want like, when the user focuses, I want it to open. Um, and so lots lots of different um, flexibility there. And it comes naturally out of the API design. It doesn't have to be a special prop for every single um, different thing. And so as a result of that, uh, downshift is also much smaller. Um, and so if you're concerned about the size of your application um, and uh, download speeds and stuff like that, um, downshift is, is like way, way smaller than anything else out there. In fact, um, you can bundle the preact uh, library with downshift into like its own little vanilla JavaScript autocomplete solution. And it, that is smaller than any other autocomplete library that I've found. Um, it has an entire framework with it. So um, yeah, that's thanks to React though. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's also like really, really accessible. Um, I, I've had accessibility researchers um, look at this component and say, yeah, this is really, really good. So if, if you care about accessibility, um, then downshift is, is the library to go with. So anyway, that's just a bunch of things uh, about downshift. So if you need something like uh, auto or an enhanced input, then take uh, take a look at downshift. Tell us about the testing library. Sorry, what? Uh, the React testing library. Oh, the React testing library. Um, so yeah, the React testing library is a, um, I actually built it because I'm giving that workshop about testing at front end masters and, and also doing that for workshop me. And um, as I was preparing the exercises, um, I, I, I try to teach iteratively. Uh, you didn't really see that tonight because of the um, time constraints, but normally like I'll say, okay, let's implement this using raw APIs, no libraries. Let's just see how this works. And then we'll um, iterate until we get to these libraries that kind of take care of some of those those uh, things for us. And the jump between uh, the raw APIs and Enzyme was just really huge. So I was looking for you know something in between. And as I was doing that, I realized that um, I didn't actually need Enzyme um, because lots of the things that I was using Enzyme for, um, like the Enzyme is just a really, really huge library. And um, if I can kind of cut that out. Um, on top of that, Enzyme exposes a lot of PI. Uh, it encourages testing implementation details. Uh, they say it it encourages you to unit test your um, your components, which it, like from a purist tester um, attitude, then yes, maybe that's true. But I don't care about unit testing, integration testing, and I don't care about like all the forms of testing. All I really care about is making sure that my code doesn't break in production. And so um, like whatever I need to do to make that happen, I'm, I'm happy with. And so what I, what I have to do is I, I like the, the closer your tests resemble the way that your software is used, the more confidence they can give you that your software will work when it is used. And so like, like, just take that literally if, if my test is literally clicking through just like a regular user, I'll have really strong co confidence that my application is working. But that's not practical, and so we have to make some trade-offs to uh, automate some of this stuff. So, um, but the the general principle it, it like stands firm. Like the closer your tests resemble the way your software is used, the the more confidence they can give you. And so I don't really care about um, like the nitty gritty details of testing implementation details in, of my components. I just want to uh, to test the test that the thing work um, in the way that the user is going to use it. So that's what the React testing library is. It, it's um, all of the, um, it, it's just the, like a, a pretty small wrapper on top of React DOM. Um, it just calls React DOM render with your component. Um, and then it gives you back a container. And that container is just the DOM node. It's, it's the DOM node that your component was rendered into. And then you can call query selector. You can do whatever um, that you want to in there, but it also, provides uh, utility functions for querying um, your container in the same way that the user would find um, things that you've rendered in your container. So if you're testing, if you're testing a form, um, it has a username, password, and submit button, then how is the user going to find out where they should enter their username? 
Well, they're going to look at the label and they'll see, oh, that label says username. I will go to the associated input field and type in my username. And so we expose a, um, a function called get by label. And it will use, say, get by label text username. And that will give you the, the form control that's associated to that label. Uh, and so, and then when the user is ready to submit the form, how do they do that? Well, they find the button that says submit, and then they click on that. And so, in your test, you'd say you know, by text to submit, and then um, you you simulate a click or you fire a click event to it. So, it, just the whole library is is written designed to encourage you to test your components in the same way that they're going to be used by users. Um, and so, that's that's the basic idea. I'm actually super excited by it. The, the core library, like those, those different queries, uh, um, are, was actually extracted and is now used by Vue testing library and Cypress testing library. Um, I expect there will be like an Ember testing library and Angular testing library eventually. Um, so I'm excited by this. I, I think it'll help us to write more accessible um, applications because it kind of forces you to associate labels with their, their input fields and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's the basic idea of the React testing library. Cool. Thank you very much, Kent. We'll uh, let you off, but thank you so much. Yeah, thank yeah. you.